<laughs> so yeah, welcome everybody to our first information session uh, for Synapse Carers, our uh, wonderful carers program. And I just want to start by doing an acknowledgement um, of country. So Synapse wishes to acknowledge the traditional custodians on the land on which we are meeting, the Wallamadigal people. We pay our respects to elders, both past and present, and to emerging leaders. We ask that the wisdom of the ancestors be with us today as we share and learn more about the experiences and understanding of brain injury and you know, specifically brain injury. Thank you. So I am Megan Baker and I'm one of the project leads for Synapse Carers. And this is the wonderful Lauren Bannerman. <laughs> so between the two of us, we are coordinating uh, this new program. Um, yeah, so welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone for coming along. Um, as Megan said, we're the joint project leads for Synapse Carers. Um, Synapse Carers has been, um, has received two years of funding from the National Disability Insurance Agency Information Linkages and Capacity Building Grant Scheme. So what that means is that we've received received money to develop a new program specifically for New South Wales for a particular cohort of people and, and that is carers of, of individuals with brain injury. So we're really excited about it. The funding started on the 1st of July. So we've got two years to, to roll it out, prove its worth and hopefully it will, will, will continue on from there. Um, the reason that this came about was in Megan's and my work with Synapse. I've been with Synapse for about two and a half years and Megan coming up to two years. And we've found that a lot of the work that we do um, with participants and in terms of participants of the NDIS or, or clients and their carers is that the shift from state-based funding to federal-based funding has made that, that area quite challenging for carers. There's, there's less support available for carers now that all of the, the funding is tied to the individual. We also know the evidence has proven that the better supported the carer is, the better able they are to care for their loved one, the more likely they are. Proven. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> absolutely. The evidence has proven that the more supported the carer is, the better the outcomes for the, you know, for the client, for the loved one. They're more likely to have better physical outcomes, better emotional, social, and possibly even economic outcomes. The better supported the carer is, the flow on outcomes to the individual, which is why the NDIA have agreed to, to fund this project, because that's what the evidence shows. It also shows, of course, that the better supported the carer is, the better their own outcomes. In terms of, of social outcomes, they're able to connect with other people. They're better emotional outcomes that we can talk about reducing stress and care of burnout. The more likely the carer is going to be able to contribute economically in, in workplace participation. And to date, um, the evidence hasn't shown that with the introduction of the NDIS there's been any improvement for carers' economic participation. So we know that the evidence is, is there that supports it. And that's really what Synapse Carers is about. It, it came about of, from what Megan and I were seeing of, of the people we were working with and, and a real desire to support, bless you, support our carers so that they can continue to, to grow and succeed both as carers and as individuals in their own right. Um, Synapse Carers particularly recognises that, that carers commonly experience increased stress, a huge amount of increased stress. They increase, they experience social isolation. You know, if you're, if you're caring and um, you know, you're, you're stuck at home sometimes, not always, it's very hard to get out of the house. It's very hard to plan to come to events such as these. And you know, we've already had a few people email us this morning and say, I wanted to come, but I haven't haven't been able to get there today or, or this has come up and, and like Megan was explaining with the Facebook group connections group, perhaps the carers just haven't been able to organise to get out of the house. It's too hard. You know, we, we there's some social isolation there and one of the most common things I hear is people don't understand, you know, my friends after the you know, for example, after my wife had the, had the accident, no one understands what it's like for me, how hard it is for me to get out of the house. I can't relate to people. So there's that social isolation. 
Um, of course, the employment disruption as well. It's very hard to continue working part-time, full-time, or studying, whatever it happened to be, once you take on carers' duties. So we know that that's, that's happening. We know that carers need adequate support to be able to continue their caring role and also to continue as, as active individuals in their own right. And as I said from the beginning, the more supported the carer is, the better the outcome for both the carer and the individual. So that's, that's the essence of how finance carers came about. That was something Megan and I, with the support of our, our manager, Chris, put together the, the funding application to get money so we can support carers such as the few of you who are here today and the broader New South Wales cohort. So in terms of what Synapse carers Synapse receives funding to do with Synapse carers, the, the program's going to incorporate three, three core areas. Um, family liaison officers, so that's, that's family liaison officers who will be employed by Synapse. Um, Megan will talk about it in a bit more detail, but someone with lived experience who's going to work alongside acute hospitals, um, brain injury units to then have um, support for the carers and in, in turn, of course, the individual themselves with brain injury in the transition from acute to community. So a brain injury unit to home or perhaps from aged care facility to home. Um, you know, the, that transition stage, which we know is tumultuous for, for all carers and individuals. Um, the second core item is the monthly support program, which we haven't set yet, but that'll be running next year and it will involve um, subject matter experts coming and talking to, to groups about areas that, that commonly come up, themes like challenging behaviour, um, relationships, um, support, what's available in terms of NDIS or workers' compensation or lifetime care and support, what's out there for me. So we'll have those sorts of things. But beyond that informative side of it, it's also meant to be an, an, um, a, a place for carers to connect, to, to combat some of that social isolation. Uh, and again, Megan's going to talk a bit more about that. Um, and the online resources. So we part of the funding is, is for a platform that's going to be purpose-built for Synapse carers, where individuals can go on and easily access information specific to, to what they're looking for. Um, we haven't said it all yet, but it'll, it'll include forums for, for carers to go in and talk to one another, opportunities for more informal social interaction and lots of information and, and recordings and, and information for carers. Um, all of those three things are the, are the core, which is going to be led by something called the Carers Advisory Group, which is, is one of the things that we're hoping will, will, will come out of today as well, because part of the, the funding for, for Synapse Carers is that it's going to be co-designed with the people that it's developed for. So it's for carers of people with brain injury. We want carers of people with brain injury involved in what's actually going to work for you, what's meaningful for you, and what would be most helpful. And our service providers, a number of you are here today, you're the ones who are working day in, day out with the, with the carers and the individuals, and we would like your, your input into that as well. So we'll, we'll cover that a bit more. Megan? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, so talk a bit more about the family liaison officer. I just wanted to acknowledge Jennifer saying, yes, social isolation um, through the Facebook Live. Uh, yeah, understanding that one, living that one. Um, yeah, so wanted to talk a bit more about the family liaison officer role, which I think this, I'm really excited about this because it's, uh, yeah, it, uh, the number of stories that we've heard of nightmare transitions um, and I guess also that that time of being being in the hospitals or and then you know I guess that artificial environment maybe it's not real life really in there and then getting out and there being this big big hole for a lot of people and um, yeah so really wanting to support people with that transition so the exciting part about this as well is it's going to be filled by someone with lived experience because they get it more than anybody else can. Um, and that is something that we hear so much um, as well, is, is having those people that actually understand that experience. And they, they know the things as well that they were missing 
that they would have that would have helped them. And so that's going to be, um, yeah, I guess we will be starting. So for those of you who don't know, I'm now based on the mid north coast of New South Wales. So we have, um, yeah, we've just started there about mm, six, seven months ago. And it's just, it's a bit of a hotspot for brain injury. So there's a lot happening there. Mm. And we're going to, we're going to, I guess, start the um, flow we call it <laughs> the flow the first um, position there to really I guess we're working really closely with the brain injury rehab service there um, and the stroke service as well um, to really work with people really closely and with the private and public hospitals um, to make sure that we get it right so then we can actually start rolling it out in other different areas um, so yeah working closely again with with the services that are, are there to support people and also closely with, you know, I guess we'll have our carers advisory group, which you'll hear more about, that will help us to really shape how this is going to look. So once we've kind of tried it out and um, tested it out, we can, yeah, get clear on what's working and what's not working. Um, yeah, so the, the family liaison officer will receive um, training and mentorship through that so um, yeah I guess there is there's the support there because it can be it can be quite a big experience to go and meet someone in hospital and then to to walk with them through that and I guess if you've also had that lived experience there's kind of that there but they'll have um, Lauren and my support through that whole whole journey um, yeah Sorry, Megan, can yeah. I just add on to that? Yeah. Um, we're very fortunate as well that we've been given some additional funding, some additional peak funding. And we're working on another project as well, which is hopefully going to give us some more funding to be able to increase the number of these roles that we have. So, and they'll be, the re they'll really be targeted in regional sort of areas of New South Wales with that real local presence. So, um, so eventually we should have a number of these roles. I just want to acknowledge that they're coming from a couple of different sources of, of funding mm. as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so another part of the program is the support program. So yeah, the idea is that we will have subject matter experts. So the um, advisory group is going to help lead us and guide us as to what, what that's going to be around. What is the information that carers actually want and what's going to be most helpful in their lives. And so that's how we're going to set um, how they will be running. Um, so yeah, it, it is about connecting with other people with similar lived experience. We also understand that, again, like today, people can't necessarily be here. Um, and we also, we have people, we actually have people in the carers group that are outside of New South Wales. Um, but we have people all <coughs> over New South Wales as well. So how are we going to make sure that they're receiving support um, and can be engaged in this as well? So. At this point, and again, it's kind of, we're, we're in the early stages and really want to create this with, um, yeah, hopefully our, our advisory group, who, whoever um, is part of that, to look at how these programs are gonna work best. You know, whether we have it uh, kind of run here in Sydney and have the, the speaker here and we film that and then we have little hubs outside where groups can kind of gather and they get to watch and then they can have their own discussions around everything. So they can have the local connections, but they're also part of the broader um, broader program. And also just having, even if people aren't able to get involved in those, having them recorded. So people are still getting that information. Um, and yeah, I guess a, a, another part that's going to come, we're going to be getting lots of information through those programs that we'll be able to use um, in some of our other information that we'll be um, sharing with people. So it's going to be, it's a really important part of, of the program and we really want to make, make sure that we can make it as accessible to as many people as possible um, across the state. Can you can just yeah. the only restricted to NDIS participants? No. Carers or no. anybody with caring for their friends? Yeah. So they have some like workers' home or yeah. Home care, but they are not eligible for NDIS. Yeah, absolutely. So a anybody caring for someone with brain injury. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Okay. 
So yeah, I guess like I was saying, those those groups and the the program, the support program plus the advisory group, that is going to help us get some really good online resources. So those resources, I mean, Synapse already has. Um, for some of you may have seen uh, the facts, our publication, which we know that that's incredibly useful. We, we are constantly getting feedback and <laughs> I think we can, I, I'm constant, every time I come to Sydney, I'm getting more and more boxes of, of the facts or having them posted to me because they are just really useful. But we also know that things change and we need to keep things updated and that's, we want to make sure we're getting the right information and also getting the information that's directed to carers. So some of our information isn't necessarily directed um, straight to carers, so wanting to get that together and get it together in different formats. Um, so yeah, having those those videos and things that people are able to watch because reading a whole lot of stuff can be overwhelming for some people. It might just be too hard to do. At least if I'm watching something, maybe I can fold my laundry or whatever at the same time. So making sure we've got different different ways of getting the information out there and that it's coming through carers and through service providers that understand we're not just going to make it up. We, we could, we've got all sorts of great ideas here, but uh, it's going to serve people best if we yeah, do co-design all of this stuff together. Um, the online platform is another thing I'm super excited about because I think that that is going to give a lot of opportunity to, for people to that are in more isolated areas or who just can't because of the caring role that they're in and maybe for their health, they're not able to get out. Um, so those online forums, and I think Facebook has been, is fantastic and it's working really well for some people. We're having really good conversations, really supportive. I've, I'm just so constantly um, impressed by the support that's there when people are kind of, this is going on, I don't know what to do, when people are just there giving their support. And so I think for some people going on Facebook, they're never gonna go there, which is fair enough. Um, but there's gonna be an opportunity to have those conversations and to get that support on this platform and kind of be this online space, one-stop shop for all things brain injury. Um, yeah, to, to be able to get information and connections, um, yeah, all, all together and in those different types of, yeah, able to read it or listen to it or watch it. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's probably about it there. This one's yours. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Megan. So the Carers Advisory Group, um, it sounds as though, you know, you're here just to be recruited for the Carers Advisory Group, and that certainly, you know, is part of it for some of the people here who are, who are interested. The idea of the advisory group is that we're able to, to tap into your, I'll use the, just to use the collective, your, your lived experience, your experience as a, as a very experienced service provider, for example, and, you, you know, your, your lived experience and understanding of what it's like to live with a brain injury, what would have helped you, what did help you, what you wished you'd, you'd known, what you, what you wished had happened, what you wished service providers would have done. And we can together, as, as Megan said, we've got some great ideas about what, what we think carers need, but neither Megan nor I are, are a carer of an individual with a brain injury. We do have that experience of working with, with carers and individuals, but we, we need other people's help as well to get this, this right. Um, so the idea is that we'll be able to draw on a, on a core group of, of people who are willing to, to give up some of their time to attend a few meetings where we're going to be to be hashing it out. What is what are the how are these monthly support programs going to work? Are we going to have a core hub in, in Sydney or, or Port Macquarie or Dubbo or um, Albury? You know where are they going to sit? How are we going to get carers to attend those? What's the most pertinent information? You know, from my experience, I might say people want to know about challenging behaviours. They want to know about how to keep the relationship going and what services are available. But that might not be what's most important for you, Christy. You know, that we need we need your input. Um, we we would like carers to be involved in the advisory group, and we would like service providers, um, peace bodies, 
um, to be involved. Um, we're also looking at, at um, individuals who are interested in, in attending who may have a brain injury themselves um, in order to get that perspective in there as well. Um, as I said, we need your, your input and, and service providers and, and case managers, people who are working you know, in the brain injury units, in the hospitals, in the nursing homes, in the care facilities, you know, that, that brings a really valid and valuable perspective to it. Um, the lived experience of, of individuals who may be, you know, a sister or a, or a husband or a grandparent or, you know, an, an ex-wife or, you know, we've, we've got lots of different types of carers that we, we, we want to have a varied perspective coming to that advisory group. You know, maybe um, we know that we've got a couple of young carers that are reaching out reaching out for help. So we, we really want to build on all of those different perspectives and, and bring that into the delivery of the monthly support programs and the online resources. Um, the Carers Advisory Group will also have some, um, some input into the Family Liaison Officer role, which will be, you know, the mentorship and the training will be provided by Synapse, but perhaps there are perspectives that the Carers Advisory Group brings that that are important. Megan's already had some, some input from the social work support Macquarie brain injury unit that, you know, that the person who's coming along who has the lived experience of brain injury needs to be able to put the other person at the centre of their journey and, and be able to cope with that, that separation, that it is not their journey, but they are there to walk alongside and assist and help. You know, so those sorts of things that the carers advisory group will really be able to to help us with. Sorry, to also add, sorry, Lauren, um, I think also in terms of providers also being involved and, and carers may be able to give you a perspective too, it's also knowing what else is out there that other organisations are doing so that we're not doubling up as well or that we can include that information or link those provider services on the um, platform or um, and so on as well. So I think that's another important perspective that also gets brought in by the advisory group. Yeah, I think that's a very good point with regards to providing an online resource. There's so many online resources there that are very good. Uh, in many cases, there's possibly not the need to reinvent the wheel, but to somehow link them all together to have. But as a carer, I would prefer to see a national kind of database where everyone can put in, but it has got a really good search function where you can find very quickly the information. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Um, one thing we should mention um, with the carer's information that's going onto this platform and the building of that platform, it's one section of a much larger platform that's being built, which is part of a national IFP grant that we also got. So that, that national funding that we received was to build an overall platform for not just carers, but individuals with brain injury, all the different types of neurocognitive disability. Um, it, it sort of focus on different cohorts, provide information for um, whether it be people from call backgrounds or maybe Indigenous Australians or whatever it may be. Um, so it's, it is part of a much bigger um, overall platform as well. But I totally agree with you that we don't want to be just creating another yeah. platform that's the same as someone else's. Um, so the carers advisory group and in terms of what Brooks was saying about the, the benefit to us of providers attending and the benefit to providers of being able to share those those resources and find out what else is out there um, and you'll also you know for any providers who are coming along will also be able to to have input into the, into the program so what we're looking for I've, I've probably already already covered a lot of this but the carers advisory <coughs> group we're wanting um, the people who are interested um, to come along attend meetings and provide input into the, the educational topics that we cover so the information that we provide in the sessions the monthly sessions that's then recorded and and displayed on the website for people to view later as well as the the educational and the information that is available on the on the platform the subject matter experts that we we come in so so Anne, sorry to point you out Anne, but Anne might have have one of her therapists that is you know really experienced, I know one who's had 24 years experience in, in brain injury that, that, you know, and might say, oh, well, I think, you know, this person might be really good at, at being able to do this 
you know, or I've heard so and so is really great at, at talking about this area, we might be able to, to look at that for the experts themselves. Um, themes and trends, you know, what is what is happening in the NDIS? What is happening for those who are not eligible for the NDIS? What are the, <coughs> for example, because I've been working in the NDIS for a little while now, the local area coordinators, for example, they, they are supposed to provide that more for general community support. What's happening there that can help our carers? Um, the carers advisory group would hope would provide some input into ways to increase participation of carers. Um, not just in the advisory group, but in the broader carers group and in broader community settings, um, access to support, as well as um, feedback on the project development implementation. This is a, at this point a two-year funded project, and we would love that it didn't have to, to end at the end of the two years, that we can continue. So feedback from our advisory group so that we can collect the data, get the feedback, and, and advocate for it to continue beyond that time. Um, at this point, these are the proposed dates. I've just popped them up there in case anyone's thinking I'd be really interested in, in being involved in the advisory group. Um, at this point, I've just set three. Now, over a really difficult period, <laughs> December, January. <laughs> um, but we we want to get this up and running as soon as we can. So we're wanting to, to get started. The advisory group is, is something that, that I'll be leading down here in, in Sydney, where um, we're nothing at the moment, but we will be moving to Parramatta uh, probably in January. Often? <laughs> yeah. December, <laughs> January. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So so we just this group. No, sign up is, oh. is moving from Epping to Parramatta. Yeah, we're back to our own office. office. <laughs> we're a bit cramped. So we're going to much bigger. Yeah. And, and Parramatta is just, I think, a lot more centrally located for our border. So yeah. yeah. So accessible on the trains mm. and buses and all those sorts of things. So. You know that we would like whilst this is a new south wales wales wide project um we will probably in for logistics we will probably hold the carers advisory groups in our office either in epping or Parramatta. so if that's a consideration for you who are interested um i know this is a small group you're certainly not being you know the only people that that we're wanting to draw the advisory group from we you know we're, we're in the very early stages with as megan said we've got 27 odd people in that group. We've got other providers and, and carers who weren't able to come along today that are really interested. Um, and in a few slides, I've got some comments from particular carers um, and providers that they would have wanted to say had they come today and things were really important for them that we'll be, yeah, we'll be looking at. Um, so in terms of, of well, we probably don't need to do this one now, but I've, I've got two different sheets so that you know, if you're interested in hearing more about the project, I've got one for you to put your name and contact details on it. But if you're really interested in the carers advisory group and, and feel like you have the time um, to, to give up to come along to those to provide information, um, that we would really want you to write your name down on that. But um, we know that there's probably going to be a lot of questions and comments, or we're hoping that there will be. Um, so we'd like to, you know, maybe Megan, if I scribe and. Mm -hmm. If there's, if there's anyone that's got comments, oh, um, your voice will be on there. Your image won't, but your voice will be on, on Facebook Live. Everybody okay with that? If you're not, we can switch it off, yeah? Yeah? Yep. Okay. <laughs> we, we, do, we do have a few things um, coming through the Facebook Live. Um, so a few around NDIS. <laughs> um, and yeah, I, I think just not necessarily having the information um, that they needed. So I think NDIS is probably one of the big things that <laughs> um, wanted to be said. But also um, another thing that was said was um, not even knowing where to look for information. Um, that was a, yeah, another thing that came up. So you can continue to bring them through. I'll keep checking. Um, but any, any questions or any, I guess, ideas or thoughts that you have at this time. So just Ooh, last stop, sorry. <laughs> because just on what you just said about not knowing where to look for the information, that was a big problem in my life with my husband. His injury was 11 years ago. Um, and you have to dig. Um, workers' comp does not willingly come forth with information about what you are entitled to. Mm. And 
everything to fight to not find it. Or if you find out by other people that have been through it or something, someone makes a suggestion, you're like, oh, really? Cool. Like, I didn't know that well, we could go on holidays and take carers with us. I thought I had to be the carer on holidays because I do, I was working and a carer at the same time. So I was in care on weekends. But every time we went on a holiday, it was just, it was very difficult to wake up. And I would love to have taken a carer with us <laughs> so that I didn't feel stressed the whole time. Um, and yeah, they just don't come forth with that information. I found that out two years ago. So eight years into his injury, I found that we qualified for that. Mm. So yeah. 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 Find the information because it's so hard. Yeah. yeah. And I think even, like, you know, I guess even like what Lars was saying, like, there can be a hell of a lot of information mm -hmm. and trying to trawl through that. So I really yeah. feel like yeah. the, <laughs> the platform, and even, I mean, we even see it in the Facebook group already people starting to come forward like someone puts the question out there and people are able to respond yeah. there and then rather than them having to dig yeah. through a whole lot of stuff. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah 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 i had from someone i was the carer of a 16 year old son mm -hmm. with brain injury and he goes to a special needs school and he's now at the age where we need to start about the transition from school into adult life slash work slash occupation slash meaning of life mm -hmm. and uh, quite challenging I would say more than anyone else has gone through this and uh, the school has put a database together with you know all the contacts all the organizations that are out there with all the information it's just incredible it'll be such a waste if that source of information it just stays within the school mm -hmm. i wish mm -hmm. that you know all the organizations out there collaborate in some way and we have mm -hmm. as a carer i know there is the database yeah. the new south wales database for example where all these are merged together mm -hmm. and can be managed with one single search engine mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Even support coordinators would like that too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I was just going to ask about um, is there an age? Is it under 65? Is it pretty OS or no, anyone? Yeah, no, it doesn't have to be um, any OS specific because if we just, if we did that, then, you know, there's a whole bunch of people that are mm. missing out. Mm. And even though you might not be able to get any OS support that way I guess that's why these sorts of programs are there for those people that may not be getting those individualized plans yeah but I did just think as well as far as um, any service providers and those sorts of things I another thing that I would really love to do whether you uh, end up being one of the subject matter experts I don't know but um, we do do some Facebook live events, so I do interviews, so we'll have live conversations on a particular topic um, or opportunity to share about your program or service that you're providing as well, so we can actually talk about it. They get to see someone, maybe ask some questions, and it's also there for other people when they come in, because I do see people join and they start going through everything and start to see things and then comments can come through through there um, and then I can kind of direct them on on to you for that as well so that's yeah would be something if you're interested in doing that I'm always up to people to yeah help help provide some more information yeah. mm -hmm. any other questions or comments so if you were part of the, the, the advisory, advisory group, group yeah. <coughs> Would it be possible to join the meeting via Zoom or, or Facebook or something yeah. else that you would do? Because Parramatta is the other end of the world. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, we're certainly open to that, and certainly, you know, with the whether it's part of the advisory group or whether it's part of the other meetings, you know, as Megan was saying, up in Port Macquarie. Um, she's not going to come down to Sydney for all of the, the advisory group meetings and also the, the family liaison officer role that will be filled there you know we, we wouldn't expect the flow to come to the meeting so by for we have another um, Adobe Connect that we will be able to use um, 
I certainly think that there is some benefit to people physically being in the room, um, but I don't, that wouldn't be something that would prevent us from, from joining with you. We'll certainly hold it in our, in our offices in terms of a logistical kind of thing, but we're certainly open to you Skyping or, or connecting in in a different way. Yeah. And depending on the interest, um, we may have, you know, you know, say we get 20 carers and 30 service providers wanting to be part of that, that, that becomes a bit too big for an advisory group. So whether we actually suggest that we have a core advisory group, you know, maybe limit it to 10 people so that we can come to decisions and then have the extended group who are asked for, for feedback or, or input through, you know, you know, we send a survey monkeys out to ask for people's opinion on certain things so that they, everyone can still be involved in the way that they want to be, but we can actually still make decisions and, and in the advisory group themselves. But as you can probably hear, we haven't worked all of that out yet. Um, and that's, that's really the point of this information session to get those sorts of comments and, and feedback. Oh, sorry. Oh, no, no, no. no, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just with the, the, the question of age, does it also include children? Are we talking young yeah, children? Yeah, so like this is for like yeah, this is for for, for any for a carer who is who's yeah. caring for an individual with brain injury. Yeah. And it's really important actually that it does cover yeah. the full spectrum of ages. Yes. Um, like you're going through transitioning yeah. at the moment, and yep. you know, yeah. a lot of pediatric type services yeah. don't deal with that very well. Mm. So, so what? Sorry. Uh, one experience I have made as a carer is, um, for example, that I attend meetings or talks uh, to find out it's so generic; uh, it, it doesn't really apply to me. But you don't find that out until you actually mm -hmm. have like, generated yeah. that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think one thing we need to keep in mind is that. Time is, is very, very precious for carers. Mm. So if we do have meetings, we need to make a real effort to mm. have them really well facilitated and well built in. And that includes letting people as specifically as possible know what will be part of that meeting. So people can decide, is this relevant for me or is this not relevant? Yeah, because you might have more inputs on a bunch of topics. You might have certain inputs that I had that wouldn't really relate to me, and I might be able to provide a bunch of input yeah. from a different perspective. Yeah. And then maybe different people would be better at yeah. attending different types of meetings. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
crisis that occur they need more support um, that broader support though will also come from our national info and referral um, support services that we have mm -hmm. and our we also have our advocacy team and other different support teams that may also then feed into that support for those families as well yeah and I guess once once we get like I've tried it out we will get things more polished as well we're going to have information um, in a really uh, I guess and, and things in a really good um, package so that we're meeting people and they're getting the stuff that they need I think one of the things yeah, that um, most people want is consistency of information yeah um, and it's like you know with NDIA experiences we find that you know from the NDIA side it's very <laughs> inconsistent so as a you know someone working in that area you can't predict mm. what their needs are mm. to properly represent your participants mm. so um, having some an organization like Synapse to be that hub of lived or, or experiences that you process so that you know you've got you know hundreds and hundreds of people who are feeding into that information hub mm -hmm. um, you're getting more consistency than anyone else out there is trying to provide service so it's just a give and get out sort of like oh what do you know about this and you know get your hands up and move yeah. on and you know I can go ahead and continue to support coordinate my participants but um, I only represent like allied health services mm -hmm. and um, you know I need to know more about carers and and their experiences and what the issues are because my clients still have those issues too but mm -hmm. I can answer most things about therapy but um, to have somewhere where you can actually come in and, and feel like a trusted network of information mm -hmm. is available and um, yeah so and to be troubleshooting what are those inconsistencies that are happening and then feed that back to the NDIA body and saying you know we just you've got to make a decision about this kind of situation because yeah. there's been some yeah. And I think that's what the most frustrating thing is, that we're all just guessing. <laughs> yep. I think originally a lot of the things under the NDIA became generalist, yeah. and many allied health professionals have said to me, I don't, I'm a speech therapist, I don't know anything about other parts of home modifications or whatever it is, we're trying to make us all these generalists oh, to like begin with. Leave and therapy, it's yeah. like, you know, yeah. a speech you can't provide OT yeah. advice, but the NDIA expect them to. Yeah. Yeah, so I think we're sort of learning by that sort of process of not networking, and in fact, it's been quite detrimental in some areas, especially for poor participants and the carers. Well, from even the therapist's perspective, they feel like they, you know, their years and years of expert experience has been undermined, and they're second guessing their own decisions, or they've, they've um, been told that, you know, I don't like your method of way you came to that decision. It's like, well, you know, with no experience and great experience, where's the truth mm. of what should be yeah. decided? Yeah. And that's, it, that is very challenging because you've got somebody on one side of the fence that is trying to do the right thing and they're the, on the other side of the fence that were, you know, representing the NDIA and working off a cheat sheet mm -hmm. and sort of going, trying to make such incredibly <laughs> important decisions that have no knowledge or experience within that <laughs> framework. And it's becoming yes. us and them. And yeah. um, you know, yeah. therapists actually um, have to, like in order for participants to get a fair result, have to exaggerate need in order to expect a reduction in that mm -hmm. approval. Mm -hmm. And yet, you know, I've had conversations and planning meetings where, you know, it's like, that they've got their needs and I've got my needs and at the end if you just open the book and say well you know tell me what you're looking for and, and you know I've had you know comments back oh you, you know it's so refreshing to have a transparent conversation it's like you know mm -hmm. we're all hating each other mm -hmm. and um, so you know if you're just sort of like everybody saying you know let's be honest and open um, you know I can't give you 120 hours of therapy but you know let's put that on for next year and do and like if we've just had this open conversation mm -hmm. it just everybody's less stressed mm -hmm. I had that happen something similar recently um so workers comp used to be individual insurance companies like mm -hmm. GAO, QBE, all of them like that workers comp and then it all brought under eye care recently which runs like to the support and that that's made a huge difference but oh I just lost my train of thought <laughs> 
Um, oh, no, that's not what it is. So with GAO, I had such a terrible experience that, you know, if you cut your hours back with your carers, you risked never getting them back. Mm -hmm. And so I just wanted to keep them the same all the time. And that means you just put carers in and around the house. You don't have any family time. Um, mm -hmm. But now that it's come under eye care, and I actually, I hinted at something in a meeting, but was a bit scared to hint at it, because I'm like, I don't want you to cut my hours. <laughs> And I just said, oh, I'd really love to have more family time. And, you know, I'd really love to experiment with cutting some hours back, but I'm just too scared to do that because I don't want to lose all my hours. And they said, oh, no, 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 your, your husband is approved for 24 hour care. You've done a care needs assessment, you get 24 hour care, that's fine. You can experiment with cutting the hours back and having your family time in the evening. Mm -hmm. So having carers come home at 6.30 to 11 p.m. And if you find this doesn't work for you, you can go back to mm -hmm. that. Um, mm -hmm. which is, but you were so scared to say it <laughs> well, and, and speaking from you know like where we sat in that arena um you know if it was a gio client wow well, they're not going to get this if it's an rma they're going to get about more. this yeah um, uh, each each particular insurer yeah. has different levels of um approval and, and, and the case manager that you got yeah. like i've had six case managers mm -hmm. to deal with and we've had so many different experiences so well, that's an experiment and a successful outcome. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, with yeah. all those things, I guess, um, whether it be though the workers' comp system or whether it be the NDIA, like, and I, I want to just emphasise this project is, it, it is, um, we're very fortunate, it's funded by the NDIA and the IOC grants, but it's certainly not um, NDIS focused in any mm -hmm. particular way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because as you were saying before, um, in terms of, you know, employment and transitioning into employment from school, is such a critical issue and in, in other forums I know employment has come up as a very big topic yeah. um, so there's that whole other um, that's a whole another system of navigating your way through Centrelink and the employment mm -hmm. services sort of system which is so this is very much going to be focused on all of those different systems yeah. mm -hmm. so that you know if it is that you're trying to get maybe the carer is trying to help their, um, their loved one apply for the DST maybe that's what it is um, so that they can go in um, to the forum or talk online with somebody who's going to help them find that information they need to know what what medical information do they need for that particular assessment. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't really matter what what system it is, but maybe yeah. just understanding the you know the New South Wales health system. Um, it would be focused on all those different areas to cover all the, the topics that you're all talking about. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of gaps in those co-aggregate requirements. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Talking about with Lauren was that someone mentioned to me recently because we've got some things that we can't get with GPs. <coughs> Someone said we might be able to get it through NDIS, so whatever the gaps are that workers' comp aren't covering, yeah. might be able to help in with because we've got a son, and GP is not allowed to take care of our son who is a nurse there. Um, so I have to be there 24/7. Um, I've got someone helping me watch today, but <laughs> but yeah, like that maybe I should be applying for NDIS for Jason because maybe then he could get a childcare worker to come into the environment to help mm -hmm. him take care of. He's so capable of taking care of his son, but they are just so funny about it. Maybe that's going to help me. So. Yeah, yeah, just knowing those little things. It's true. Mm -hmm. A lot of our clients have different people have NDIS. Oh, okay. Cool. And there's, yeah. <laughs> and there's, there's <laughs> no, a classic example of yeah, it, it, not us. Annoying. It's both like, yeah, so <laughs> where you, I've heard some be people say, if you've got, you know, life not care, no, you can't have NDIS. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's what I thought. And they've just yeah, cut and tried. So they don't know. Mm -hmm. But they're just, there's yeah. these sweeping statements on things yeah. and, and this information floating around the system directly. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not, it's not right for the individual. Yeah. And, it's, and it's incredibly confusing, and it's not right for the people that are providing services as well. Yeah. Yeah. That's why the forum might be good because, like you say, you just pop on a question and someone, everyone will come at you with some good information. Yeah. 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 And I think that that's a really good point that, that the, the information is inconsistent all the way across. It's not just across all the yeah. yeah. consistently, yeah. consistently inconsistent. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I think from a few of the things that you know, from probably Kellyanne, where you were bringing up around the hospital, the finance care assistance isn't, isn't designed to replace what's already there in terms of, you know, particularly we know in, in brain injury units, you, you've got social workers, OT, speech pathologists, mm. all, all, and the social worker probably being the one who has the most contact with the carer around coordinating and figuring out what's out there. But the flow is, is not designed to, to replace any of that. It's designed to just complement and, and help mm. the, the mm. transition from, from hospital to home. Um, and it, you know, Synapse Care as is a, is a place of information isn't designed to replace all of the other ones it's about providing. 
as much as possible of some consistency and information. I think this is what it said. Yeah, the hub of making it a hub of lived experience, you said, Anne, mm -hmm. to help develop some consistency. Large, you were saying about reducing the, well, I paraphrase, reducing silos, consolidating the information so it's, it's in one place. And it's more helpful for Christy, who at 11 o'clock, you know, you're thinking about the carer, you know, you wanted to reduce your carer hours, but you're scared about this and you want to know what else is out there. You know, science carers isn't going to replace it, all the information that's there, but it's designed to, to make it easier, easier to access and more relevant to, to the carers of who we work with. Maybe go to the next slide because some of the things that were coming up. Um, so, uh, as some of you might know, I've been working as a support coordinator with clients with NDIS plans, um, and that's that's probably over a year and a half, and and that's a lot of the reason why we're now doing this. Well, can't take all of the credit, but that's that's some of the reason why we're now doing this program because I've seen what's been happening for carers in the in the change. Um, so when I was ringing around and, and explaining to my wonderful carers and, and participants that I was moving into a, a different role, um, these are some of the things that were coming up. And you know, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say it, but you know, yeah. Nicole's dad really wanted something in particular said today, um, and a couple of other Helen really wanted something else said. So I do want to go through these things, and, and they're quite common. You know, some of the things that we've been talking about have come out as well. So. It's really hard for, for, for Nicole's dad to plan to leave the house at certain times. It's really hard for him to know what the situation is like so he can plan to be somewhere like this, even though he would have a wealth of knowledge and experience to share and gain from these sorts of things. So it was really important for some people that the information is recorded and is accessible for them at a time that they can make it work, whether that's two o'clock on a Monday morning. Mm. Whether that's on a Sunday afternoon, whether that's you know before the carer leaves at half past six by Wednesday night, mm. at a time that's right for them, so they can make it work for them. And whilst that doesn't necessarily reduce the social the social isolation that this program is is you know designed to help with, it's still assisting that person in a way that they can make it work, and they're getting the information to them in the way that's going to help. Can I make a comment? Yeah, of course, Ron. Um, I, I just uh, sat on uh, on the screen the other day and uh, watching a recorded uh, mm -hmm. uh, session and uh, in that one hour was about uh, 10 minutes worth of relevant information for me mm -hmm. and I had to sit there for the whole hour to fight that 10 mm -hmm. minutes worth of information. Mm -hmm. So if we can find a way of transcribing this into writing into meeting, yeah. and there's software around that can even do that, uh, that would be, once again, it's just for, for time saving. Time is just mm. so precious for carers. Mm. Uh, if uh, we can have just a summary of mm. the key points that come out, because we, like, here right now, we keep having side kind of conversations, which are very important, very good, but not in necessarily relevant to everyone who's watching. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's a really good point. Um, I mean, it probably won't always be possible to, to do that for everyone, particularly when we're talking about the, the information sessions that we're hoping in God will be held monthly, you know, that are going to provide that social connection as well as the information. So. <laughs> For in terms of the recordings for people to watch when it's convenient to them, we'll, we'll reduce it to so it's just the subject matter expert presenting. But as you say, people want to put their hand up and ask questions, and I think everything that's you know we've been talking about is, is certainly helping Megan and I. But there's always going to be those instances where where we go off Here topic like and to talk about we, their story. Yeah, yes. and, and, and when you have the opportunity know. to do it, I think. You know, this, that, that's yeah. part of what this is yeah. about. Yeah. And say it's been influencing you in ideas. Yeah. And I think you find that in your reconnections group, Megan, that you know someone might ask something, and and other people are able to answer or, or follow on from that, and it's, it's it builds a it's part of that community building, that social connection building. Yeah. Sorry, Lars. So uh, one technique can, for example, be that you ask presenters to 
put together a self-explanatory PowerPoint presentation mm. of which uh, people can have access to. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Um, I think that that's something that we would certainly be able to ask and Adobe Connect, if, if that's a platform or similar yeah. one that we'll be using, make it usually really easy to, to do. Um, one of my other clients I've been working with for two and a half years basically, she said um, the son that she cares for um, is part of our reconnections group, which you may or may not, not know about, a peer group and even holds um, regular face-to-face catch-ups for some of the, the individuals with brain injury. It's really hard to go along to those sorts of things. Um, what she suggested is that maybe, you know, every now and then at some of these carers groups, you have the individual with brain injury come along to meet other people who are being cared for as well. And, and, it, and it increases the social connection and meaning for both the carer and the individual. So that, that particular client really wanted me to, to share that. Um, someone else said New South Wales is not just Sydney, so we do need to make it work for people outside the major cities. Um, certainly we're, we're doing our very best to do that in terms of the platform, recording things, making them accessible. The, the family liaison officer roles, certainly starting in, in a more regional area and the other one or two, or depending on how the, the funding goes and how we spread the time, we'll be spreading out through the regional centres. And you know, one possibility that will be discussed with the advisory group is that perhaps the hub is Port Macquarie or Dubbo or, or here, um, but then the family liaison officers host the mini session where parents can come along to that that place and have the the presentation on show, and they can have their own crackers and dip and, and have a chat after the session. Um, or of course, carers who can't make it can log on and, and watch it live or watch it at two o'clock in the morning, whenever it works for them. Um, one mum sent me this one around the, the hospital, which I think, you know, Kellyanne, if I thought you were coming up, and, and Helen works in um, Liverpool Brain Injury Unit, so she's probably very knowledgeable about this. Uh, one mum said there was too much information. You know, she got 500 pages of information from the social worker and she, you know, didn't know how, it was too overwhelming, she couldn't do it, so it meant that she didn't apply for Centrelink until four months later, so she, you know, she couldn't access info, it was too much. Um, she also wanted to know what opportunities there were within that acute phase, bless you, of connecting with other carers. You know, she was, for this particular client, they were actually in, in, in the oncology ward, so different to the brain injury units, but what opportunities were there at that stage to connect with other people for for knowledge, for comfort, knowing that someone else was going through the same same phase. Um, practical information, you know, she said for six months she didn't know that you could get parking reduced, um, didn't know how to get to Centrelink, didn't know about any available services within the hospital or, or outside. Um, she said start talking about rehab options early because rehab means hope, rehab means future. Let's, let's you know, start that information sharing earlier in the hospital. Um, information is always a big one and how do we consolidate it? How do we make it specific for, for our time for carers? Um, one of the things that this client said was, um, we had no idea that a neuropsych assessment was going to be so important for us to get access to the NDIS and then the specific therapies that we wanted afterwards. Mm -hmm. You know, for others, it might be an accommodation assessment by an occupational therapist to help them get into specific accommodation. You know, mm -hmm. What is the, if I don't know that I need a neuropsych assessment to get that, how do I get a neuropsych assessment to get that? You know, <coughs> so it's getting that information. Um, you're talking, Lars, before about life stage transition. So, you know, from younger children to the NDIS rather than early intervention, from, from high school to study or employment, you know, from, from employment to, to retirement, there's all the life stage transition. How do you access those specific supports? Um, ongoing care connections, you know, that was something that's come up a lot. I wish I had more opportunity to speak with other carers, speak to someone who knew what I was going through. Um, I don't think she'll mind, Anne, but Fiona, one of Anne's OTs, who was meant to come today but was unwell. Um, she asked me to pass on a couple of things. And one of the things that she said that was really interesting is, is whether we need to look at the changes of language rather than seeing the individual as a carer 
which places burden and, and responsibility, we've, we've changed the language and framed it more as a coach. You know, you're there to, to help. You, you'll receive training as a coach to be able to guide the person. You don't have to do that for the person. Involving the carer as a coach to help the person through. Um, so that was a really interesting perspective. So she was talking about getting, um, trying to encourage the carer not to do for the participant, when possible, encouraging the participant to do it for themselves. But of course, the carer or the coach in this instance needs training in order to be able to, how to do that and how to do it appropriately for their person's needs. Um, and the added, I put it in the burden, um, when the person who is caring also has their own health mm. conditions, medical conditions, perhaps their own disability. One of the, the our wonderful clients who wanted to come today, wonderful carers, also had her own physical and NDIS plan and, and things were too overwhelming for her today and she wasn't able to make it. Our carers have, have other burdens. Um, many of the clients that I work with, their main carer is their aging mother. Mm. You know, that's, that's a reality. It, it might be a gender and age stereotype, but it is the reality for a lot of, a lot of clients. You know, the, the aging mother or aging parent is, is, is a primary carer. Um, so of course that, that impacts on their ability to care and to access these sorts of things. Um, so I wanted to share those because they, they were what came up in, in conversations with carers and, and providers. Have something I, I just want to say goodbye to the people on Facebook. The battery's about to go, <laughs> and I don't want to lose this because there's people that weren't able to watch it live. So I'm going to say bye. <laughs> um, thanks so much for joining us. But if you have more comments, just put them um, in the box below, and we'll address them and add them to all of the information we're gathering. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>